morning, good morning, and welcome to Grace Bible Church. Uh, a couple quick thank yous. Thank you to the Coggins family again for letting us use your property. It is a great blessing and encouragement to us that you would let us meet here. Also, uh, thank you to, to the Wilkies for doing sound. We know that's a lot of work. Thank you for hauling all this stuff out here and setting it up. We appreciate it. Uh, if any of you ladies have not yet joined the Romans Bible study that started this past Thursday, uh, you can do that. I saw Sandra with some books, didn't I? Was I imagining that? I think I did. Yes, she, she's got some books here. So if you're interested in that, talk to Sandra. She's sitting right here in the front. It's Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock, and you will be sorry if you do not join. There's some good teaching there and good fellowship. How many people did y'all have last week? But 13 ladies joined. And it's a it's an online thing, so you're, you're not going to wilt and fall over dead from, from taking part. Also, the young ladies have a prayer group uh, that meets on Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock, 7, 7.30. Ask Ivy if you want to be a part of that. If you're a young lady, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, talk to Ivy. Join them. Let's, uh, oh, one more thing. If you're interested in baptism or membership, you can either tell me personally or you can go to our website at gracebible.online and uh, get on the contact us tab there and so contact us it's not really contact us it's contact me so if you just send an email there that says who you are and that you're interested i'll get a hold of you we can talk about that our call to worship is from well it just depends on which way the wind blew the page ah it's blowing it the right way now psalm 96 psalm 96 oh sing to the lord a new song sing to the lord all the earth Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would enable our hearts to tremble before you. Uh, the greatness of your majesty, the greatness of your love, the greatness of your power, the greatness of your compassion, all of those attributes that make you so wonderful and so beautiful and so greatly to be praised. Uh, we acknowledge this morning that strength and beauty are in your sanctuary that splendor and majesty are before you because Christ is there and he is all of these things rolled up in one. Uh, Lord, we want to know Jesus better this morning. Uh, we praise you, Father, for being our creator, our sustainer, our God, our king. We thank you for sending a Messiah, a Savior, to save us from our sins, to reconcile us to yourself in order that we might see your glory forever in order that we might behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ as endless ages roll on. And we want to be able to look forward to that joyful future this morning by faith. I ask, Lord, for those here who know you, that you would increase our faith, that you would increase our delight in Jesus, that you would, Holy Spirit, enable us to block out distractions and the cares of the world that will soon be gone, and to focus in on Jesus Christ and to be changed by what we see of him in his word. Uh, Father, we pray that the message of salvation would be clear today. We pray that the work of God in Christ will be clear, and we also pray that it would be clear to us who we are as fallen creatures in need of grace and mercy. I pray, Father, that you would inhabit our praises now, that you would help us to sing and bless your name, and that as we sing, we would not be mouthing words, but that our hearts would be going up to the Lord Jesus Christ in devotion and in praise, and in love. We ask this for his name's sake. Amen. You can stand. First song we'll sing is There is a Fountain. Uh, hopefully you got a purple folder off the table there. 
when you came in. If not, you can run back and grab one real quick. That's where the songs are. There is a fountain. religions throughout all the world. I mean, you've got Buddhism, Hinduism, you've got all these uh, churches that are just focused on social gathering. You've got uh, all sorts of variations of every kind of religion. And uh, the thing about religion is it's not a relationship. And religion is man trying to reach up to God. And uh, the thing about 
you know, that is, it's, uh, it's not man finding God. It's not man finding God. It is man finding Satan. And the way it was for me, I mean, I, you know, I was, you know, want to be God of my life. I wanted to be ruler of my life. I wanted to be. It's as though I'd given myself a PhD and I was going to honor myself throughout the rest of my life, you know, and I think most people are like that and struggle with that, but, you know, it's all about a relationship with a real living God who loves us. And I'll start in verse 18 here. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them through his invisible attributes. Namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And let's pray together. Well, God, we just thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us all to meet here again today. And we just ask, God, that you'll just help us to uh, focus on your word here and what's going to be taught here. And just bless Brent and his efforts to bring us the truth of your word. And God, it's the truth of your word that we want to seek. And we just want to uh, uh, realize our sins, and we just want to realize uh, the false beliefs that we've had all of our lives. And forgive us for denying you. Forgive us for trying to live out of our own selfishness and live in our own ways. And uh, the, the, the misconceptions we've had about you and your wrath and the things about uh, you that are just so plainly taught in your word. God, just make your word plain to us today. And we thank you, God, for, for uh, just being so kind to us and uh, so rich in your blessings. And God, just help us this day to bring honor to you. And we thank you. Amen. Okay, let's say it one more time. And you should have a song there entitled, I Want to Know You. I Want to Know You. I want to 
the glasses again. You never know where you put them. If you're like my grandma, they're always hanging around your neck. Or like she was. <laughs> Go through the house looking for glasses that are hanging around your neck, Grandma. All right, I'm getting like that real fast, and I'm sure you are too. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll read John 5, 30 to 47. Our Father, we're thankful for the Holy Scriptures. We're thankful that you've not left us in the dark, but you, that you have revealed yourself to us, not only in creation in a general way, but in Christ in a specific way through the Word of God. And we believe that these words are inspired, inerrant, and infallible. We believe that uh, the apostles wrote them as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And we believe that every word in this book is true. We believe that every word in this book is in agreement with one another. And we believe that these things, Lord, are helpful, that they point us to Christ, that they show us the one true way of salvation in this world. And so we want to receive your word now with humble hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would give us an open ear. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would enable everybody that's listening, both in person and online, have a supernatural ability to pay attention to what is being said, to see how it comes out of the text, and to receive it by faith. We pray that Jesus would be exalted in this sermon. Uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, as we listen, and, and I pray for myself, Lord, that even as I preach, that our desire would be uh, to have your approval, to have your smile, and that you uh, would be able to say to us on the last day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want to be faithful to you. I pray, Father, that you would uh, just forgive me of all my sins, uh, sins of thought, word, and deed. I ask, Lord, that the, the countless ways that I have failed you this week, uh, above all, the ways that I have failed to cherish Jesus above all things, that you would forgive me. Uh, thank you that Jesus has paid for those sins and that you are quick to forgive those who trust in Christ. I pray, Lord, for those who don't know you this morning, that they would be able to see the condition of their hearts as we Look at this text. This text tells us a whole lot about who man is as a fallen sinner and what we are like, what the fallen heart is after. And Lord, even in those of us who have been saved, there is much of that corruption that remains. And uh, we pray that we would be able to see where we're out of step with the Holy Spirit and to be able to repent today. Uh, Father, we pray that you would take charge of this time now and that we would be able to leave different people than when we came people who treasure Christ more than we did when we first sat down here today. And we ask that you will continue to build your church and pray that you will continue to make us ready to meet Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. I'm trying to get this mic moved to a place where I'm not bumping it with my shoulder because every time I bump it, it's going out. So um, I'm going to fidget a little, but we'll get it straightened out in a minute. Uh, John 5, we're going to pick up in verse 30. If this is your first time joining us, at Grace Bible Church, we've been preaching through the Gospel of John since March. I know that chapter 5 isn't very far in by, what is it, August? Yes, August. <laughs> but sometimes I'm long-winded. So hopefully we can finish John 5 today. John 5.30, Jesus responding to the Jews who want to kill him because he has healed a man who was lame for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. They said, you can't do that on the Sabbath. Jesus said, my father is working till now and I'm working. They said, you're claiming to be God. We're going to kill you. And Jesus is responding, continuing to respond to these Jews who want to kill him for claiming to be God. Verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. <clears throat> you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, 
but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And so as Jesus continues to respond to these Jews who want to kill him because he has claimed equality with God, uh, you're going to see that these Jews are denying the clear implications of what they've seen about Jesus' mighty work and mighty deeds. He has done this astounding miracle. Now, nobody could raise a man who had been lame for 38 years with a word but God. And Jesus came and said, get up, take up your mat. And this man got up. Jesus did what only God could do. He said, my father is working till now and I am working. And so Jesus claimed to be God. It was clear, but yet these Jews were denying the evidence, denying the implications of what they had seen. And so when people choose to deny reality in order to avoid a truth that makes them uncomfortable, psychologists have a term uh, for describing this kind of behavior. It's called denialism. Denialism. And denialism is a defense mechanism that's meant to protect a person from mentally disturbing facts, and ideas. Most people engage in denialism because they are protecting some overvalued idea that is critical to their identity. And so uh, in John 5, that overvalued idea that was critical to the identity of the Pharisees was this, we're good people. We can get to heaven on our own merits. Jesus is saying, you better come to me so you can have life. And they're like, we just saw you do that miracle. We can't deny it, but we deny that you're God. Okay, so denialism is denying obvious facts. And as Jesus continues to respond to the denialism of the Jews here in John 5, his response gives us some deep insight into how the heart and mind of fallen men and women operates. These verses answer an important question for us. Why do people refuse to believe in Jesus? These verses give us that answer. Now, I'm not talking about people who have gotten uh, bad information about Jesus or haven't heard the true gospel or don't have the facts. I'm talking about people who have heard the true gospel, have seen the facts about Jesus. Why do those people refuse to believe? These verses make that clear. And the first thing they teach us is that the reason that people don't believe in Jesus is not because they lack evidence. It is not for a lack of evidence. So Jesus repeatedly appeals to the evidence that he is the Son of God in these verses. He gives five witnesses to his deity. The first witness is the Father. Look at verse 31 and 32. He says, If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. He's referring to his Father. Look at verse 37. Verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself born witness about me. So how has God the Father borne witness that Jesus is his son? He has enabled Jesus to speak and to act in a way that is in perfect harmony with the will and the actions of God the Father. Look at uh, verse 19 of chapter 5, the last part of verse 19. Jesus says, whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Look at the end of verse 30. Jesus said, I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So the Father bears witness that Jesus is his Son by empowering Jesus to do what only God can do and enabling Jesus to say what only God can say. So the life and the light and the power of God the Father shine forth through Jesus, and this is the Father's testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the first witness that Jesus brings forth to give evidence that he is the Son of God. The second witness is this, uh, John the Baptist. Look at verse 33 through 35. <clears throat> Jesus tells the Jews you sent to John, that is John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. 
He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So John the Baptist was recognized in Israel as a, a, a true prophet. Okay? And if you remember back in chapter 1, these same Jews sent a delegation to John the Baptist and said, Hey man, what are you all about? Some people are saying that you're the Messiah. Are you the Messiah? And John the Baptist said what? No, the one coming is the Messiah. And then in John 1, 34, John the Baptist said, I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. So Jesus says, there's the evidence that my Father has presented that I am God the Son. There's the evidence that John the Baptist has presented that I am God the Son. And the third piece of evidence is Jesus works. Jesus works. Look at verse 36. <clears throat> But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So all through Jesus' public ministry, he clearly and consistently did things that only God could do. Jesus said, look at my works. They bear witness that I am the Son of God. Jesus has just finished healing a man who's been lame for 38 years. What did he do in the previous chapter? Remember how the official's son came to him and said, My son's sick with a fever. He's at the point of death. His son is 15 miles away in another town. Jesus says, Go, your son will live. He healed him from 15 miles away with a word. Remember John chapter 2? They were at the wedding feast. They ran out of wine. Jesus, we're out of wine. Jesus makes 120 gallons of wine out of water. All through Jesus' ministry, he did things that only God could do. Jesus was a miracle worker par excellence. In the 1800s, J.C. Ryle made seven observations about Jesus' miracles. Listen to them real quickly. First, he said, take note of their number. They were not a few, but many. Secondly, their greatness. They were not little, but they were mighty interferences with the normal course of nature. So, so we have lots of miracle workers today on TBN and things like that, and so you get somebody like Todd White, and he goes out to, to a park bench, and he sees that he sees some poor person sitting on the park bench. He says, what's wrong with you? Says, oh, my left leg is at one inch shorter than my right leg. And so Todd White gets down on his hands and knees, and he starts massaging the other leg, and everybody goes, oh, their legs are the same length now. This is not the kind of miracles that Jesus did. When Jesus did a miracle, it was a suspension of the natural course of nature. Think about the publicity of Jesus' miracles. They were not done in a corner, but they were done in open day before many witnesses, even before his enemies. Like, how do you feed 5,000 people in the wilderness with a few fish and a few loaves of bread? Like, how do you pull that off if that's not the real deal? These were genuine miracles. Uh, J.C. Ryle also says of these works of Jesus, they were visible and would bear any examination. So we talked a little bit about this. Uh, I don't remember if it was last Sunday or the Sunday before. But one of the things that Jesus' opponents never said was, you didn't do that. They never said that. They always just tried to impugn his character. They never said that the miracle didn't take place because it happened in broad daylight. It was undeniable. J.C. Ryle says, think about the genuineness of the mighty works of Jesus. They were not staged mechanically, but happened in the natural course of the Lord's ministry. So th this, this is not a TBN type thing either where, uh, you know, we've got some people behind the stage who really can walk and they're wheeled out to the televangelist acting like they can't walk. And then we slap them in the forehead and they fall over on their back and get up and start dancing around and say, I'm better, I'm better. You know, none of this stuff that Jesus did was a put on. It was not staged. And then finally, J.C. Ryle says, think about the efficacy the efficacy or effectiveness of Christ's miracles. His cures were instantaneous, not gradual. They were complete and perfect, not faulty and disappointing. So if a person undeniably does what only God can do, and he does it for the glory of God, then that person must be God. Right? So if, it, if it waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If a person does what only God can do for the glory of God, that person must be be God. So uh, the Father, John the Baptist, uh, the works of Jesus, those are three evidences. And then the fourth one is this that Jesus puts forward. The Scripture, the Scripture is evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at verse 39. Verse 39. 
He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. So the entire Old Testament, rightly understood, is pointing to Jesus Christ as the coming Messiah. Whether in types or shadows, direct prophecies, uh, revelatory events, or laws that anticipate their perfect fulfillment in Jesus Christ. After his resurrection, Jesus said this to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. He said, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Like if you don't see Jesus in the Old Testament, it's not because he isn't there. So how, for instance, do you rig something like Isaiah 53? You take Isaiah, Isaiah 53, which perfectly describes in minute detail the crucifixion of Jesus, 700 years before Jesus existed on the earth. Then Jesus comes and dies, and he perfectly fulfills Isaiah 53. How, how do you set that up? I, I'm not talking about a broad statement of what's going to happen on the cross. I'm talking about minute detail. Like he was buried in a rich man's tomb. I'm talking about little things. You can't make that up. So the scriptures bear witness to Christ. And then finally, uh, Jesus says, think about Moses as evidence that I am the Son of God. Look at verse 46. He says, for if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Well, how did Moses write of Jesus? Because when I read the first five books of the Old Testament, I don't see Jesus' name in there anywhere, do you? You remember a few months ago when we were talking about the uh, instance where the Israelites were bitten by serpents in the wilderness? And Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole and lifted it up and said, Do you want to be healed from your snake bite? Look at this bronze snake on the pole. He's talking about how Jesus is going to come later on and be lifted up on the cross. And if you've been bitten by the curse of sin, you can look at him and be saved. That's how Moses wrote of Jesus. It's important to remember that the main hurdle that people face with regard to faith in Christ is not a lack of evidence. There's plenty of judicial proof that Jesus was the Son of God. The main problem that mankind faces is that we are sinners who suppress the truth. We suppress the truth. That's what the scripture that Lee read made very manifest, very evident, that sinners suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Listen again to Romans 1. Paul says, by their unrighteousness, men suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So Paul says that creation is undeniable evidence that there is a powerful and a holy creator somewhere. You want to know if God exists? There you go. Look, you see? If you can't see God, that's not God's problem. That's mine. That's your problem. That's a suppression of the truth. And what does Paul say is mankind's response to the evidence? That there is a powerful and holy God somewhere. He says their response is to worship the creation instead of the creator. Their response is to make idols and bow down to them. Paul goes on, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. That's the Ph.D. thing that Lee was talking about earlier. We've all got a Ph.D., don't we? Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This denial, this suppression of the truth is rampant in our culture today. Think about the things that people say in popular culture. But think about just the topic of abortion. What do people say? Well, go ahead and kill it because it's just a lump of tissue. Well, newsflash, you're a lump of tissue too. And so am I. I mean, people give birth to people. 
humans give birth to humans. But people say, oh no, that, that's just a lump of tissue. That's called suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Think about this whole thing about a, a gender fluidity. I mean, this is the greatest example of the suppression of the truth I have ever seen. Well, we don't know if he's a boy or a girl. If you have male reproductive organs, you're male. If you have female reproductive organs, you're female. Why can't people acknowledge that? We're going to hold the truth down in unrighteousness. This is the human condition. And people hate God. And they will deny the most obvious things in the world, like somebody being a boy or a girl. And they'll say, well, that's just something that you Jews and Christians have concocted to foist your power on us. This is the condition of the human heart apart from Christ. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is what the Jews in chapter 5 are doing to Jesus. Jesus says, look at this evidence. One, two, three, four, five. I'm the son of God. They say, we'll kill you. Now, it's important to give evidence for what we believe. We, we're not into uh, blind faith based on no facts. We're, we're not Mormons here. Uh, God... Uh, can God give us evidence to bring someone to saving faith? Of course. But the main reason people refuse to believe in Jesus is not the lack of evidence. It's more important, therefore, to pray that God would bring lost people out of a state of denial. That's what happens when somebody's born again. The God, the Holy Spirit, comes into a person's heart and brings them out of a state of willful denial of the truth. Prayer is our greatest asset in seeing people come to faith. Because only God, the Holy Spirit, can give someone a heart of flesh, a heart that is soft enough, a heart that is uh, able, humble enough, to acknowledge the truth about God, the truth about themselves, the truth about Jesus. So these Jews had plenty of evidence, yet they were planning to kill Christ. Think about how this scene that we're reading about here in John 5 basically illustrates the teaching that Jesus gave us in John 3, 19. John 3, 19 says this. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Why would these Jews in John 5 not come to Jesus, the light of the world, for salvation? Because it would show them up to be the self-righteous hypocrites that they were. They would have to confess that to be saved. And only the Holy Spirit can enable us to stop denying the truth that poses such a threat to all the idols that we're clutching every day. Pray for your lost friends. Pray for your lost family members. Pray for your lost co-workers. Yes, speak. Yes, give evidence. But pray for them. God has to change people's hearts. You and I can't do that. All right, so why do people refuse to believe in Jesus? We have seen that it is not because of a lack of evidence. Uh, it is because of the pride that blinds people to the truth. We don't have an evidence problem. We have a pride problem. So what we're uh, basically talking about now is a biblical anthropology, a biblical understanding of the real problem that people have. And the Bible is teaching us here that we are blinded by pride as fallen sinners. Human beings are proud and self-righteous by nature. We are born that way. And these Jews in John 5 are premier examples of how pride causes a person to believe what they want to believe. Okay? Pride makes you believe what you want to believe because pride makes you want to be right. Pride is incompatible with the gospel. Who wants to believe that they are a fallen sinner under the wrath of God, and that nothing about them can ever give them a right standing with God. Nobody naturally wants to believe that about themselves. But pride causes a person to interpret the evidence in a way that is not right. It blinds us to the special revelation that God has given us about his son. Look at verse 39 and 40. <clears throat> Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life so who was a more diligent student of the old testament scriptures than these jews who wanted to kill jesus well the answer would be nobody they had the book memorized they knew it by heart 
You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. So in their pride, the Jews saw scriptural knowledge as a means of spiritual self-exaltation. It had become a way to build up a righteousness of their own. They read the scriptures through the lenses of pride, and it blinded them to the truth that the whole Old Testament is pointing to our need for a Messiah to save us from our sins. They had the blinders on. Pride blinded them. Jesus said, It is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So the Old Testament teaches that we need a God who is going to come down and rescue us from our sins. And because these Jews were blinded by their pride, they saw it as a way that they could lift themselves up to God by obeying His commandments and keeping His laws. Pride does funny things to your vision. Pride keeps us from seeing in a spiritual 2020. Look at verse 45 through 47. Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So pride had blinded these Jews to the fact that the law of Moses is not a religion of self-salvation. It is the righteous standard of God that exposes men as depraved sinners who cannot keep God's law. So if the Jews had not been blinded by their pride, they would have been eager to receive Jesus as someone who could save them from their sins. But they were blinded by their pride. So every time they read Moses and read things like the Ten Commandments, they said, yep, yeah, doing good on that one, doing good on that one, doing good on that one. Paul in the book of Galatians, Galatians writes about how clearly the law of Moses points to our need for a Savior. Listen to Galatians 3. Paul says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. And then Paul quotes from Deuteronomy, he quotes from Moses. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. It's funny how you can read Moses and it says, Cursed be everyone who does not obey all things written in the law, and then in your pride think, I can save myself by obeying God's law. That's what pride does. It deceives. It blinds. The law of Moses puts sinners under a curse. The law of Moses shows us that we need someone to bear that curse for us. That's how humble eyes read the Old Testament. Proud eyes can't read the Old Testament that way. Paul goes on in Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. But the heart that is blinded by pride closes its eyes to that obvious truth. The proud heart wants to be independent. It wants to self-justify. Pride makes us blind. And there are other places in the Old Testament where Paul writes about this blindness that Jews are under because of their pride. Listen to 2 Corinthians 3. Paul says, For to this day when they, and he's talking about the Jews, he says, For to this day when the Jews read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Paul says, even to this day, when proud, self-righteous Jewish people read the Old Testament, it's like there's a veil blinding them to Christ, blinding them to their need for a Messiah. He says, to this day, their pride has blinded them to seeing the true meaning of the Old Testament. In the 16th and 17th century, uh, a lot of people wore wigs. I'm sure you've seen uh, guys in these crazy-looking, curly, white wigs that everybody wore in the 16th and 17th centuries. And uh, During that time, when the newspaper would come out with a story that was obviously very biased and not equitably written, people had a saying. They'd say, they're trying to pull the wool over our eyes which meant that they're trying to pull our wig down over our face where we cannot see. And pride is a sort of spiritual wool that blinds us to the truth. In their pride, these Jews imagined they had nothing to fear. They imagined that they were just fine with God. We're secure. We're doing okay. Pride blinds men to their awful condition. 
Pride blinds us to the fact that we're standing on the edge of a pit and about to fall in. Pride blinds us to the fact that we can't do anything in a way that would please a God who is infinitely holy. Pride blinds us to the fact that we're under God's wrath and we need someone to save us from the wrath to come. So the question I have this morning for you is this. Has your proud heart deceived you into thinking that you will be just fine without Jesus? Not that's that's 95% of Americans. I'll be just fine without your Jesus. Thank you very much. Has pride blinded you and put you in the same condition as these Jews in John 5? Has pride convinced you uh, that when you look around at all these other people in culture, that you're living a life that is better than they are, at least I'm not doing this, or at least I'm not doing that or the other, and so I'll be all right. I I'm fine with God. Doing fine. Thank you very much. Don't need Jesus. Is that you this morning? You see, pride doesn't want to humble itself and say, I have to be saved by grace and grace alone. I can't save myself. I have to receive salvation as a gift. Only people who come to Christ as bankrupt sinners with nothing in their hands to offer can be saved. And I'm just telling you, the proud human heart does not like the terms of the gospel, though they are gracious terms and loving terms and kind terms. So why do people refuse to believe in Jesus? It's not a lack of evidence. It's the fact that we're blinded by pride. And finally, it's the fact that our pride causes us to want glory for ourselves all the time. Jesus talks about this desire of the proud heart to glorify self in verse 41 and 42. You see, you see pride is something uh, that's so insidious and, and, and so permeates all of our being that it causes us to have this little secret agenda in everything that we're doing, okay? And it just saturates our whole life. And what is that agenda? I hope people think well of me. People are going to approve of me when I do this. People are going to like me when I do that. They're going to pat me on the back when I say this. They're going to approve of me when I post that. And so our proud heart wants the glory that belongs to God for ourselves. And this is, this is the problem. It's not a lack of evidence. Look at verse 41 and 42, which shows us that pride loves self rather than God. Pride loves self instead of God. Uh, Jesus says, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God in you. Jesus says, I don't receive glory from people because I love my Father. And you receive glory from people because you love yourself. So he's contrasting his rejection of pats on the back from people with their desire for pats on the back from people. And he says that's evidence that you don't love God, that you love yourself. Look at verse 42. You do not have the love of God within you. They want to be praised and honored and affirmed by people. So let, let me just be straight up with you. If you want people to like you, you'll go straight to hell. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you live. If you're interested in people liking you, you will burn in hell forever. End of discussion. Because you cannot please and honor God, and you cannot accept the humbling terms of the gospel if you always want people to think well of you. You will live to please them instead of living to please Christ. Jesus is the polar opposite of these Pharisees who want the praise of man. And so he seeks his father's approval instead of man's approval. Look again at verse 33 and 34. He says, you sent to John, that is John the Baptist, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. In other words, Jesus says, look, John the Baptist told you that I was the son of God. He told you that I was the Messiah. And by the way, I don't care what John the Baptist thinks about me. I'm just saying this so that you can be saved. Look at verse 43, please. Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Why? Why? Why would they receive someone who came in their own name? Jesus came in his Father's name to give glory to the Father. Jesus said if some false Messiah comes along and wants to make a name for himself, you receive him readily. Why? Because people that are living for their own glory are not an indictment to people who aren't. 
But Jesus came and he was all about bringing his father glory. And that was an indictment. His life was an indictment to these proud, glory-seeking Jews. That's why they wanted to kill him. He exposed their satanic rebellion, which is this, the hidden agenda of getting the praise that belongs to God alone. But what does the Bible teach us? Was Satan's sin for which he was cast down. I'm going to get on God's throne and I'm going to get the praise that belongs to God. And the seed of that is in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl. So at Grace Bible Church, we want to be a church that is about the glory of God, which means that we are in a steep uphill battle <laughs> to get anywhere, okay? Because our whole culture and everybody living in it wants glory for themselves. At Grace Bible Church, we want to be about the glory of God. We want to seek the approval of God in all that we do. We do not want to prostitute the gospel by turning it into a tool that people can use to get glory for themselves. We don't want to present Jesus as the means to health and wealth. Oh, I'll take Jesus if he can make me healthy and wealthy, and then people can see how much money I have and how healthy I am and come over and swim in my pool. We don't want to give out that kind of Jesus. We don't want to make Jesus the mascot for the latest social justice issue so that we can get all this praise for being super virtuous people. We don't want to present Jesus as someone who's here to help us get rid of our bad habits because, you know, that bad habit really makes me look bad in the eyes of others. You know, I would really like to quit drinking so much because it makes me look so bad. Jesus is not interested with how you look. <laughs> and until you're interested in him for his own sake, he's not interested with helping you do anything. We don't want to present Jesus as someone who gives you the power to speak your preferred reality into existence with certain faith declarations. Oh, you, you want something to happen in your life? Just believe in Jesus and speak it into existence. All that stuff just feeds into the glory-hungry heart of every sinner. We don't want to be a church like that. We don't want to present a Jesus who has come to save us from a lack of purpose. Because we're too chicken to tell people that Jesus has come to save them from hell. Because if we tell people that Jesus has come to save them from a lack of purpose, that doesn't smart on their uh, proud, glory-seeking heart like telling that, them that Jesus has come to save sinners. We don't want to present Jesus as someone who helps us to be saved. We want to present Jesus as someone who does all the saving. We want to preach about the total depravity of man. We want to preach about the holiness of God. We want to tell the worth and the glory and the surpassing excellence of Jesus. We want to be a church that makes it clear that salvation is by grace alone and that Jesus does all of it from start to finish so that he alone can get the glory. We want to declare salvation for the glory of God alone. He's the one that saves. Even if that is a message that is despised by the entire culture. Yes, we know we're going straight uphill. We know that we're not telling anybody what they want to hear. We're going to tell people the truth. And God is going to bring his people to himself. Friends, we need to remember that saving faith is totally incompatible with the applause of man. Look at verse 44. This is a very, very important verse. You only pay attention to one verse in this passage. Pay attention to this one. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? If you are determined to be a good old boy, if you're determined to be the in crowd, if you're determined to be light, you cannot believe in Jesus. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? The answer is you can't. It's not possible. If we're motivated by the approval of men, how can we ever seek the approval of God? Jesus was despised and rejected by men. Now, how can you follow a Messiah who was despised and rejected by the world and have people approve of you? It just can't happen. We cannot live a life that glorifies self and glorifies Jesus at the same time. Our lives are either going to cause people to praise Jesus or praise us. They're either going to get glory for Jesus or glory for us. They're either going to draw attention to Christ or attention to us. 
Right? I don't have a Facebook account, but if I went to your Facebook page today, who would it be about? Is it about you? Or is it about Christ? If you talk to me about your business or your career today, who is it about? Is it about you? Or is it about Christ? See, there's just no middle ground in this thing. Listen to James 4.4. 4. James says, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? You can't have it both ways. You can't please God and seek His approval and please people and seek their approval at the same time. And this is why the Jews hate Jesus so much. If we're determined to be honored and smiled on by our fellow men, we will remain alienated from God. How can you believe when you seek glory from one another? So these Jews in John 5 are like a bunch of high school cheerleaders in a squad. You look so good in your little outfit. <laughs> you look good in your outfit, do it. Your tassels are so long. Oh, you've got nice tassels, too. You're really keeping the law of God. Buddy, you're keeping the law of God, too. And this is how we are because the pride of the human heart wants glory for self. The pride of the human heart wants somebody to come up and pat you on the back and say, you're awesome. You got it all together. Let me warn you about something. If you get absorbed in the self-esteem culture of reality TV and selfies and likes and followers, you will not be able to believe in Jesus. So one of the great ills of our culture in the modern day is something called virtue signaling and it is an epidemic in our country so uh, virtue signaling is this whatever the latest hot button trendy social issue is whether it's global warming or gay marriage or BLM people have to get on social media and tweet and post something that signals their support of the latest trend so that they can have the approval of the masses so that they can get a pad on like, like where is culture going? Oh, it's going over here. Well, I need to put something on Facebook that says I'm over here. And that way, all the culture can pat me on the back and give me a digital thumbs up. You need to be very wary of that. And when you get over there in the right place, here's what, here's what culture does for you. It says, you're a very virtuous person. Thank you for signaling your virtue. You haven't actually done anything to help the people. You've just signaled your virtue. We like you. Thank you for your self-righteousness. Here's the deal. The herd, H-E-R-D, herd. The herd is never going in the right direction. The herd never wants to glorify Christ. The herd never wants to hear the truth. If you want to follow the herd and you want to have the approval of the herd, you cannot believe in Jesus. You will die in your sins. How many things, ask yourself this question, how many things do I say or do on a daily basis that uh, would I not even do at all if I couldn't post it, tweet it, YouTube it, or TikTok it? Uh, next thing you set out to do, like, if nobody's ever going to know that I do or say this thing, will I still do it? And a lot of you, especially if you're under the age of 40, will be amazed at how little of those things that you will go ahead and do when you find out that nobody's going to find out about the fact that you did it. So uh, just beware of the glory craving that social media stokes up in all of our hearts. You know, uh, my dad and I were down there on campus at Western Carolina University Monday, and we were uh, filling up a water barrel beside Cullowee Creek there. You know, Cullowee Creek, it's, uh, it's about as wide as from me to the corner of the tent right there. Uh, not a massive body of water, but uh, we were drawing some water out of the creek, and so here comes this uh, carload of college guys, right? And they get out, and they got all their shirts off, and they're all ripped, you know, muscular, been pumping some iron. And they go over to this little hole of water where, right in front of Dad and I, and it's got some rocks around it, and it's, it's about four and a half feet deep. And they all start jumping off the rock into the four and a half foot deep pool of water. And so this is a fall of about eight inches, okay? This, this is just a major jump. The rock, rock was about that far above the water. And all of them, I don't know if you noticed this, Dad. <laughs> you got four grown men in their 20s standing in a pool of water about the size of a car hood. It's four feet deep. And all of them have their phones pointed at their faces, filming themselves 
I mean, I guess the world just has to know that you jumped in a four-foot-deep pool of water the size of a car hood from eight inches. I don't know how that's cool. I don't know what's going on there. But it's just so silly. And this is something that will really suck you in. Would you like to know if you're saved this morning? If so, here's the approval that you're looking for. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. If you're saved, you're trying to please God. If you're lost, you're trying to please yourself or somebody else. It's that simple. How can you believe when you receive glory from men and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Answer, you cannot. Ask yourself this question. In whose presence am I most afraid of being ashamed? God's or my peer's? Do you fear God or do you fear man? If you're about your own glory, then you will fear being ashamed in man's presence more than you will fear being ashamed in God's presence. You see, faith does not jive with the applause of man. In John 12, John 12, verse 42 and 43, Jesus, or rather John, tells us that some of these religious authorities that are rejecting Christ right here in John 5, they wind up actually acknowledging and believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But they won't tell anybody because they want everybody's approval. Listen to this. This is John 12. It says, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. So some of these people that want to kill him right now, these higher-ups in, in the Jewish religious system that want to kill him right now, they wind up being convinced but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. In other words, some of these people wind up being convinced this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. And I'm not going to say anything about it because I want people to like me. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You can't. So dying to the praise of man Listen to this. Dying to the praise of man is right at the heart of what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus. You're going to have to die to the pat on the back from the world. John 15, 18, Jesus says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And oftentimes the world is going to despise me and you because we love Jesus and we tell the truth. And you just have to come to grips with that. That's part of what it means to count the cost of following Jesus. I can't be cool anymore. I can't be in the in crowd anymore. I can't be trendy. People are going to act weird when they're around me. People are going to scratch their head and wonder what I'm doing. It's so hard for proud Glory-seeking hearts to die to the praise of man. You can't be a Christian and live to please your parents. You can't be a Christian and live to please your peers or your spouse or popular culture. You just can't do it. And the reason that we crave glory so badly is because we were made for glory. The only cure for the proud, self-glorifying heart is to seek the glory that it was created for. The glory of God, the all-satisfying glory of Christ. Jesus talks about this glory that we were made to experience in John 17 in the high priestly prayer. Just before he's about to go to the cross, he says this, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. So yes, there's something in us that wants glory. But we were made to see and savor and experience the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, I want these people who have trusted in me to be with me where I am to see my glory. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine looking at Jesus Christ straight in the eye on the streets of gold? To see the glory of Jesus. When he came down to the earth, he laid aside his glory. When we see him in heaven, we're going to see him in all his exalted splendor and glory and majesty. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine how satisfying 
Can you imagine how blissful, exhilarating, I'm talking about looking into the eyes of God, the great I am, the one who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. You're going to see that, brother. You're going to see that, sister. Jesus died on the cross to reconcile sinners to God. Jesus died so that you and I might delight in his infinite glory for all of eternity instead of being separated from him forever. Father, I desire that those whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory. So people don't reject Jesus because they lack evidence. People reject Jesus because they're blinded by pride and because in their pride they have an agenda to seek their glory in all that they do. A fellow named Tony Rinke says this. He says, Christ died for self-glory-seeking, piety-flouting, peer-fearing, narcissistic sinners like you and me. Only because of him can we now die to the praise of this world. May God give us the grace to receive Jesus as our sin-bearing king and to live for his glory and not our own and to have the agenda of well done, good, and faithful service, the agenda of seeing the glory of God one day instead of the agenda of, I hope people like me. May God give us the grace to do that by His Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the light that the Scriptures shine on the nature of man. We thank you for the light that the Scriptures shine on the kinds of sins that Jesus died to pay for at the cross of Calvary. Forgive us, Father, for being uh, rebels at heart who came into the world under the curse of sin and Adam's blood flowed through our veins. And Lord, there is still much in your children that seeks self and seeks the praise of man and seeks our own glory. There's still much pride in all of our hearts, Lord, that needs to be eradicated. But we're thankful that because of what Christ has done, it will be totally eradicated one day for those who trust in Christ. We pray, Lord, for those who are listening online, for those who are listening here, that you would show us the true state of our hearts, that you would give us soft and humble hearts, that we would not be hard and callous and resistant to the truth, and turn away to someone who will tell us something that we want to hear that makes us feel comfortable in our sin, but that we would receive this as the truth, and that, Lord, when it comes time to repent of these things this coming week, that you would enable us to do so, and that you would make the chief joy of our life the very thought and prospect of seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Thank you that Christ today is exalted in majesty and in splendor, and in power, that he is magnificent, that he is worthy beyond measure, and Lord, every craving that we now have, every lack that we now have, will be completely satisfied and made up for on that day when we see him face to face. And we just want to say, hasten the day. Lord, if you, if you so choose, we would love to see you come back today and put an end to all this foolishness and ignorance and suppression of the truth. We would love to see you come back this day bring an end to human history and bring in the kingdom of God in its full consummation. Lord, forgive us of all of our sins and give us the grace to act on these things that we've heard. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you'll stand, we'll sing. We will sing. I want to know you one more time. <clears throat>
from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. You're at liberty to go. Mm -hmm. 